service at 10 o'clock. Now, we're not going to use the projector today because the projector and the uh, machine we had last week didn't work. Wouldn't read USB drives. So I got a new machine. Not a new machine, a new old machine. Like me, nothing new is old, nothing old is new. And I brought the stick with the files on it, and guess what? I brought the wrong stick. <laughs> You see, I do believe in confession. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think the handout's pretty good. And uh, <clears throat> this week we're going to focus on Luke's narrative and the, uh, and the differences between Matthew. And then next week, as I said, we're going to take a trip uh, with Thomas and look at the Gospel of Thomas, which was written 2nd, 3rd century, probably, maybe 1st century. The oldest copy we have is second century. Uh, so let's look at 34, okay, and kind of review what we did last week a little bit. Uh, first, there are similarities and differences between Luke and Matthew's narrative about the, about the birth of Jesus. Here come the rest of our scholars. Pick up the handout. We don't find the birth narratives in... Mark or John? Where does Mark start? He starts with the baptism of Jesus. And John doesn't start anywhere. John is all about the theology of, of Jesus. And there are differences. And the question is, do we worry about those differences? No. Because it would be like if we put groups in the room and everyone started telling a little story and passing the story around the group, the story would probably come out different in most cases on the other end. Right? The other reason, each of these authors was trying to reach a different audience. Matthew was trying to reach the Hebrew population, so he starts his genealogy from... Old Testament. And Luke was trying to reach more the Gentile population. So he starts his genealogy from Adam. Right? They were both written late first century. If we talk about who wrote what, do we believe Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote the Gospels? No. No. They never take authorship credentials. But there's, for my research, I'm a pretty, I'm pretty sure that Luke did write, that he did write the Gospel of Luke, and he wrote what else? Uh, Acts. And at one point in time, Luke Acts was one word, and they were separated later, in the third century. So, uh, and he also writes to Theopolis both cases. So there's, I think, a pretty good case uh, for the fact that uh, Luke did write Luke. Uh, we don't know about John, and when you have your evangelical friends, especially your fundamentalist evangelical friends, that tell you that Revelation was written by John, the same person who wrote the Gospel of John, you can challenge them and say, maybe not. And you can challenge them and say maybe not because of one simple reason. The Greek is very different. And he never in Revelation says, I, an apostle. He just says, I, John. And John was a very common name. So Matthew wanted to show the legacy of Jesus to the Israelites in the Hebrew Bible. He really wanted to show that Jesus brought hope to fulfill that legacy because remember, the temple was destroyed in 70 CE later. Uh, we also know that originally the temple was destroyed in 586. And so the Jewish people, the Israelites, were constantly in the diaspora, which means separated. And it wasn't until 1949 when they returned to Israel they began to get out of the diaspora. So he wanted to show that the heritage of Israel could be carried on. There's some hard copies back there if you want. Okay. And 
And so, like you said, Matthew starts with Abraham, and it turns out Luke starts with Adam. Okay. Um, there are some interesting parallels. For example, can you see the parallel between Jesus, Mary, and Joseph escaping to Egypt <coughs> in Matthew and the Exodus story? Mm. So if you knew the Exodus story, you would read this story and it would make all the sense to you. That, that would probably happen. Do we really think they were in the desert for 40 years, by the way? No. No. That's a long time. And there is no archaeological evidence. If you hung around in the desert for 40 years, you'd have to leave something there, BJ, right? Probably. Well, there's no archaeological evidence. They probably took a shortcut, and the authors wanted to show them trying to get along with God and being failed, and that God never let them go. My friends tell me a lot of time, the Koran is so violent, and I say to them, go read the Hebrew Bible. It's pretty violent as well. But if that bothers you, don't let it. Because here's the key to the Hebrew Bible. No matter what the Israelites did, golden calves, walked away, wanting a king, for Samuel. We want a king like everyone else. You won't give us a king, he says to Samuel. And they get a king. And it doesn't work out too well. Saul was the first king. Okay. Here's the thing for us to take away today. God never let them go. Right? No matter what happened. Grab, grab some copies back there. There should be something. So let's go to 35. So let's look at Luke. Uh, this author wrote it about the same time as recently Matthew, but independently. It's written in classical Greek, but he kind of switches to biblical Greek part of the way through it, so he's very well educated. If it's the Luke that we read about in the New Testament, it's the Luke that traveled uh, with Paul, okay? And that's where he got most of his information. So Luke was not a first-hand observer. The stories were passed along to him by someone else. And as you know, when you pass the stories along to people, okay, they can change. Or you can manipulate the truth a little bit. You know, fake news isn't new. <laughs> right? Think about that. Everyone says, well, I'm not going to emphasize that story over here. I'm going to emphasize this story over there. The other thing we find uh, in Luke, Mary is very central to the story. Very central to the story. And that's because Luke is writing to Gentiles. And he's trying to lift Mary up. <coughs> and just take a look at her visit you know, to Elizabeth when she's pregnant. Okay, and having John the Baptist. And then they write the Magnificat, okay, which we see from morning and evening prayer. Okay, and we want to get into the Magnificat because it's fascinating. Okay. Um, there's no mention of the Magi, Magi. But there's a lot of talk about shepherds. Okay. And both of those stories conflict a little because why do we think there were three? Because there were three gifts. But were there three? We don't know. I bet JD knows. He's a prominent attorney. <laughs> so we don't really know. And if you translate the word uh, magi, it, it really means kings. And as BJ said last week, uh, from her living in the Middle East, you would have viewed them as this is your time. Mathematicians. Mathematicians. They were very From good Nisha. astrologers. They were very, what? Nishabor was the center that, that came, the Magi came from. It doesn't say that. It, no, but no. it does in Iran. 
Iran. In Iran, okay. the Center for I'm Astronomy. These are the different, these are, we don't know that they were three. Remember, when we go and do uh, a play about Jesus, or we do the two o'clock service, what we do is we kind of mash the two Gospels together and pick what we want. And that's what we really do when we, when we put things together. Um, there's no mention of having to flee Herod's regime also in Luke. Luke says Mary and Joseph actually went to Jerusalem to have Jesus circumcised by Simeon the priest. And Simeon says that famous line, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace when my eyes have seen your salvation. What a beautiful line. Why did they circumcise on the eighth? Maybe There's got to be a doctor here, a nurse, yeah. who knows the answer. Maybe by then they figured you were going to live. <laughs> Pretty close. <laughs> they come to figure out, although well, they didn't know why, that if you did it early, you may not live. Because you didn't have much of an immune system left. Yeah. And so they knew that eighth, the eighth day was uh, kind of a safe time to go, to go do that. So we have these... We have these consistencies. So let's look at uh, the narrative in Luke a little bit. <clears throat> the meaning of the manger is, and the significance of the shepherds, they're really two key points. Luke 2.1, in those days the decree went out for Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration that was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to the towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town to Nazareth, to Galilee, to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem. The census does not appear in Matthew. Now, when we go to 37, the census is really interesting because does everybody know who Josephus is? I think you should all read it this week. Josephus is a, is a Jewish historian who wrote about the same time of Jesus, and it's a work about that thing. It's like six point type, okay? And so one of the ways we check to see if they were historically accurate things happening is looking to see if Josephus and other historians wrote about it, okay? Uh, and we can see that uh, there was no real census taken nation, uh, nationwide throughout all of Rome. There were some local censuses taken, okay? But Luke wants to report on historical information and he does the same thing in Acts. Listen to what he says. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, it seems good to me, having had a perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus. What does Theophilus mean in Greek? Lover of God. That you might know the certainty of these things. So Luke's primary concern is about trying to be accurate, okay? Uh, and he does the same thing in Acts. That's always a good sign because if someone says that's what they're trying to do, the odds might be good that they really do it. Not a guarantee, but they might really might do it, okay? Uh, and Luke talks about the census which took place at the reign of Augustus, uh, and that was a pivotal point. And like I said, the census didn't take place across the empire, okay? Uh, and it probably didn't. From all what we see in Josephus and other historians, they weren't taking the census at, at that point in time. So here we have inconsistencies again. And like I said, keep in mind that Luke probably had Luke and Acts written in one volume. In one volume. <coughs> and they probably separated it for the same reason they separated kings. Why would that be? It was too long. The scroll would have been like that. When did codices, everyone know what a codex is? Codex is a first approach at making a book, and it was really adopted by the Christians in the third century. 
And what they did is they would basically sew papyrus together on the edges, okay? And it was with a codex, because it could be turned, the pages could be turned. Christians were very popular around using that. And when they began to write codices, that's when they began to separate the scrolls more specifically, and the books more specifically. Did we have verses and numbers and names of all of these biblical books? No. And we all know what the Bible is, right? No. It's a basic instruction manual before leaving Earth. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, something to don't laugh. You learn a lot of cool stuff here. <laughs> you know, so the verses didn't come along until the second, third century. It was just long, long text. Um, we worry about Luke's uh, comments on the census because we know there really wasn't one. Okay? He would not have had to travel outside of Bethlehem to be registered. Um, no census was made under Herod's regime. Josephus recorded nothing about it, but there was one later on the Quinarius who followed Herod later on. So there is an inconsistency there. Should you worry and stay up nights about that inconsistency, Steve? I don't, I don't think so. No, I don't think so. <laughs> so I wouldn't worry. Remember what the Gospels are, what Mark Strauss and I came up to name them. Historical narratives motivated by theological concerns. So there, there's a historical narrative in there aimed at a particular audience, right? Like Jews or Christians or Jews or Gentiles, okay? And it's about the theology of having that theology come forward. Luke does something else that's really wonderful. He's got laced through his entire writing piety. And he does something else. Could you? Did Rome care if you would worship someone else besides Augustus? No, no as long no. as you pay your taxes. <laughs> as long as you paid your taxes and believed that Augustus the emperor was God. If you said the emperor wasn't God, you might have had a problem, Helen. But you could have done other worship, worshiped other pagan gods. There were other pagan gods they worshiped. And they tolerated worshiping the Jewish god monotheism. They tolerated that. You know? So what's really interesting here, so if you're Luke and you want to get a little dig into Rome without actually doing it, one of the things you could do <coughs> is hold up Jesus and the birth of Jesus as something extraordinarily special compared to the emperor. And he does that by writing the Magnificat, this beautiful hymn about the birth of Jesus and about Jesus and Benedictus. You think about that little subtle thing he does. Look at the glory of this. Now, I'm going to tell you, this is this. I don't, I don't want to pop politicize this. But I thought of knowing this story, and we could take a week on this. I spent a lot of times in Washington circles in a former life, and I knew Bush 41. He came to San Diego once. He spent some time with my company for a little system we built called Profit, okay, that identified signals during the first Iraq with Desert Storm. And uh, the idea was we could identify those signals, whether it be cell phones or radio transmissions from tanks or whatever, and then we could point missiles at them and weapons at them automatically and it saved lots of lives. Lots of lives. <coughs> and when uh, the president was out here, he stopped by Lincoln to Titan to see us and to thank us for doing that and helping to save those lives. So, uh, and I knew him in a couple of other cases. And I know there was a big negotiation between the protocol office, okay, and the White House about what they would say and what they would do. The big thing that the administration didn't want is any president bashing. They didn't want any of that. I'm not going to understand that. You know, if you remember McCain's funeral, there was a little bit of that in there, right? So if you're a class act, regardless of what size of the politics you're on, what do you do? You hold someone up in contrast. Right? You hold
hold someone up, right or wrong, you hold someone up in controversy. Okay? And this is exactly what Luke did. He wasn't going to take on the emperor, but he was going to hold Christ up in contrast to the emperor and what that was going to mean for the people of God. Okay? Now there's a term down here um, you might not recognize, it's called passages. And what that is, uh, it means copying an, an artistic style. So they copied the hymns of the day. So what I want you to do, the next time you pick up a prayer book, well, like during the sermon, this is a good time to do yeah. it. <laughs> okay, especially money. Is uh, uh, go look at the Magnificat and think about the Magnificat, the Nunc Dimittis, and the Benedictus, and how. And it's straight from the Bible. Most of our prayer book comes from the Bible. Okay. Mm -hmm. And how beautiful they were, and how if you were uh, a person in Judah at the time and you heard these stories about this, how loving you would see that to be compared to what you heard about Augustus and the Emperor. Would that be powerful? Mm -hmm. And wouldn't that draw this very strong distinction between the emperor and Jesus without saying one word. Isn't that interesting? Yes. I think that's pretty interesting. Okay. The shepherd problem. <laughs> we got a shepherd problem. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before him. Which angel was it? Gabriel. Gabriel. Gabriel always brings good news. Okay. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you was born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth, lying in a manger. We've got a couple of problems here, folks. One, he probably, they probably didn't go in a manger. Probably the first floor of someone's house. This is what you would do if you were Jewish. And the other things, can you watch over your over your fields at night when it's December 25th? Where would the shepherds have been? Inside. They would have had the shepherds inside. So there's a timing problem. Was Jesus born on December 25th? No. No. We got a pretty good idea. It was probably earlier. Matter of fact, um, one of the popes around Constantine's time uh, said he was born in March of that year, of earlier. But it could have been as early as 3 BCE. And they picked March because it was nine months before Christmas. Mm -hmm. <coughs> got an interesting little tidbit. Yeah, it's wasn't, wasn't the shifting of the date had to uh, line up with the uh, the winter solstice? Yes, they did that. So we really, the answer is we don't know the exact date. <coughs> but uh, we don't know the exact date. But the shepherds were probably, if it was winter, not watching over their crop, their, their, their sheep at night, the flocks at night. Yes, Steve. I've read somewhere that that, uh, that, that that authorities theorize it was probably in the spring. Yeah, that's but what I said. I don't no, what is the reason for that? Why would they have surmised that perhaps it was in the spring? This was one of them. You would be watching over the sheep at night and outside in, in the spring. That the shepherds couldn't have been doing that in December. That's one reason. And the second thing is the Christmas holidays. And what is Christmas holidays were pagan. And it wasn't until Constantine in 326 that they made it the 25th. What does Christmas mean? We have some seminarians here in the room. Why do we, where's that term come from? Mass of Christ. 
You mean you've been going to Christmas services forever and you don't know? I can see it coming from a Presbyterian. <laughs> Christ's mass. Christ mass. From Constantine on, the Christ mass, which was the Eucharist, okay, had to be celebrated after sunset and before sunrise. And so that's where the name Christ Mass came in, okay? Um, and that didn't happen until 336 with uh, Constantine when he, if you recall, he was, we had two emperors then. Rome was too big, right? And Constantine was the emperor in the east. And he came and won the Battle of Millivan Bridge, united the empire. And he claims he won, if you've ever been to Rome and been over the Millivan Bridge, he looks at that bridge and he sees in the sky, he sees clouds shaped like crosses. And he has a cross painted onto the shield of every one of the legions. And he wins the battle. And he attributes it to Christ. But he did it for another reason. He began to adopt Christianity uh, as the religion of Rome, or as a corporate religion, more because he saw it as a way of uniting the empire and bringing the empire back, back together. So the point is that in December, the sheep would have probably been corralled. Okay. Uh, let's look at 41. Another thing Luke does <clears throat> that's really interesting, he shows the authority of uh, Jesus over John. Uh, and he has a number of passages that do this. Take a look at Mary's visitation. Mary is really held up in Luke, okay? John is in the womb, okay? And John jumps for joy when she finds out that Mary is pregnant in the womb. It's showing that Jesus will be superior to John and the joyful, okay? Because what it does is establishes the authority of Jesus over John. John was probably an Essene, a Jewish sect that retreated to southern Israel, okay, down Quran, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and that's why you read about him eating these strange foods and dressing strangely and so on. We like John the Baptist, right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Mary and Sarah. Do we all know who Sarah was? Abraham's wife. Abraham's wife. She was in her 90s, and she's told by God, by the angel, that she's going to have a child. Okay, and she does, and she kind of laughs at him and says, ha, ah, ha, that's not going to happen. And of course, it doesn't happen, okay? She has Isaac, okay? And so there's a parallel to that with Mary and the birth, okay? Mary was surprised she was going to have a child. Mary was surprised she was going to have this Jesus guy, okay? Elizabeth was also pregnant with John the Baptist. They were going to be cousins. And so that surprise that we see in Sarah's life is very similar to the surprise we see in uh, in Mary's life. And what's significant about telling that wonderful story that Luke tells again is you would have read that story. You would have known that story. Now, only 5% of the population could read, right? So how were the stories passed along? Oral, oral tradition. <laughs> they were passed along orally from one to another. And so this story would have been passed along. And so we have seen this and have built up the credibility for who Jesus was going, was going to be. Okay. Um, there's also another passage that uh, he relates to, and it's to Hannah. Who was Hannah? The mother of Samuel. Boy, you're good. This, yeah, I, and I told him I wasn't going to give you the answers this Hannah? week. <laughs> no, <laughs> she was the mother of Samuel. Samuel was the last judge. And Samuel uh, became a priest and was called by Eli, the priest. And Samuel kept being called by God and he kept waking Eli up at night. 
And Eli kept saying, go back to sleep, go back to sleep. And finally he said, no, Samuel, God is calling me. And he became the last judge and the one who anointed the first king of Israel, who was Saul, who didn't work out so good, okay? Who was followed by David, okay? They were, they were great, they were great friends. So again, we see Luke drawing these these parallels, okay, uh, between virgin births, miraculous births, dedication, and Mary, because you make the case by drawing on history, just like attorneys draw on cases, previous cases, right, J.D.? Right? And the attorneys would know what those cases were and would understand that. Maybe not the plaintiff, okay, but the attorney sure would. So they'd be a build on previous cases and they would get that. They would really get that, which was very, very cool, okay? Uh, 43. This makes sense to you guys? All right. The importance of Zachariah and Elizabeth, okay? All of Hebrew scripture we see about these special births, right? About Samuel, about Sarah. You can go through one after another. So again, you look at that trajectory of all the special births in the Hebrew Bible, and you get to write in the gospel, and how do you make a case about Mary and about Jesus? You relate to all of that. You relate to all of that. Okay? And of course, uh, Zachariah and Elizabeth were viewed as an age where they couldn't have children. Exactly the same language almost, you can compare them to what we see with Abraham and Sarah. The stories actually parallel each other, okay? And so does the issue of being unable to become pregnant, okay? And the same thing with Hannah. So we got three stories like that, and Hannah was the mother of Samuel. We got three <coughs> stories like that that are really powerful. And don't we do that same thing today if we want to make a case, want to make a story? Don't we say, let me tell you this other story. Right? Don't we do that? All? Don't you do it all the time in the shipyard? Right? <laughs> so you can see what they were doing. What they were doing, these authors were doing, was nothing that was that different from, uh, from what we would do today in very much the same way, except the stories were in most cases being passed along being passed along orally. Okay. The wise men. Okay, this is your, your chance, BJ. No, I said like, I don't know anything else to say. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Three gifts is why we probably say three wise men. Do we think it was three? No. Could it have been one? Maybe. Could it have been five? Possibly. But we do know that these kings, when you translate the Greek from the East, okay, um, were very good astronomers and were very good mathematicians. Uh, and they followed the star of Bethlehem and uh, astronomy is one of my hobbies. And of all the astronomers I have read about, we can't find any way to go parallel that or create that kind of a star to be followed. Uh, there was even some theories for a while that it was a conjunction of Venus and Jupiter, okay, which would have been brighter in the star. But no one's been able to, to find that. Is that important? No. But what does, again, following a star, what did they follow in Exodus? The tabernacle and the smoke from the tabernacle, right? They followed the tabernacle. So again, following a star, as in the Exodus story, you would, you would get that again. That would, that would relate to you in some way. Um, now we write these nice hymns, We Three Kings of Orient are and all of that, and we merge it into the Christmas pageant, and all the kids want to be kings, okay? Um, but there's nothing in the, in the Greek to suggest that they were kings but they probably were mathematicians or astronomers or people of that story, okay? And they came to follow Jesus as the Exodus people followed God and followed Moses. Again, another one of those parallel stories that we found. We think people used three because of the three
three gifts they bought, right? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But they didn't have to only have brought one, right? They could have brought, they could have brought. Are you upset by that? Not the three wise men. Good. Now, uh, 45, was Jesus really born in a manger? Probably not. Because how uh, there were no there were no motel sixes. <coughs> there weren't hotels of that nature. If you traveled and you were a Jewish person to be safe, where would you go? You would go into the community and you would stay in someone's home and you would probably stay on the roof or on the first floor. The first floor was the warmest place to stay and the most protected because guess who else stayed there? The animals. The animals. Because they were very valuable. And the roof was another good place to stay because it was safe. Right? It was harder, harder to get at. So they probably really would have looked for a uh, first floor, okay, a first floor residence, okay? They were usually uh, single room houses with a, a first floor, uh, a second floor, and we've actually found these in Palestine, they really exist, okay? So the odds are he was not born in a detached stable, he was probably born on the first floor of someone's, someone's house, okay? But they used manger because the animals stayed in the manger, and it could have been misinterpretation, um, because manger and being on the first floor with the animals, that would have made sense. So look at this first century house on page 46. Okay. I think the lower right is a, is a good example. You can see that first floor is a place where the animals could hang out. You had a second floor. The kitchen was always outside in the back someplace. Okay, And then there was the upper floor. So manger is probably a colloquialism that was taken, probably misinterpreted. And, um, you know, one of the things that I'm going to talk about misinterpretation, I was talking earlier before a lot of you got here. Uh, what's the Catholic Bible? The American Standard Bible, right? They just released a new version, J.D., and what was interesting about it that's got the church in an uproar is based on Isaiah 7.14. Isaiah 7.14 says, and a Messiah will be born. Okay? And Isaiah says this, and why he says this, why, <clears throat> why he says this is Ahaz, who was the king of Syria, okay, uh, was about to go attack Judah, okay, unless Judah agreed to work and worship their gods. Isaiah went to Ahaz and said, No, 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 don't do that. We're not, we're not, we're not going to do this. We're not going to cave in. Because there will be a king. And Isaiah is hard to interpret. There will be a king. And that's always been viewed as a, quote, nice term to remember, messianic prophecy. And it says a virgin birth. Well, the new Roman Catholic <laughs> Bible changed all of that. And you can decide here if you want to change one of our translations. It now says... This is where you got to hold on to the front of the chair. <laughs> <laughs> it now says a young woman. Oh. Isn't that what the original Hebrew word means, technically? Yes. This is always the challenge. The, the more accurate interpretation uh, of the Hebrew uh, was just that, a young woman, not virgin. And people just, when they did some of these translations, they kind of said, well, a young woman, virgin, same thing but not quite the same thing, right? So that's really started an uproar today, okay? And uh, uh, we'll see how that all turns out in the end. Do we have to use only, does everybody know what translation we use? New Revised Standard <coughs> NRSV. Is that the only version we can use? Yeah. No. If you look in the canon, Canon is the rules and the order for the church. Canon means yardstick or read or measure. There's about a dozen translations we can use. We 
just use the NRSV because it's the most common. But it's up to the rector. The rector can use uh, the NIV if he chooses, the New Jerusalem Bible if he chooses. All of those have Isaiah's translation and a virgin child will be born. So this is a big <coughs> deal. And I can tell you the Roman Church uh, is up in arms about it, especially uh, the Orthodox part of the church, as you can, you can see. But again, do we worry about this? No. There's a bishop in the Episcopal Church from New Jersey. His name is Spong. He is now retired. He's written several very controversial books, uh, several on Matthew and on the, uh, uh, on, on the narratives, the birth narratives. They're worthwhile to read if you're interested. Uh, and basically, this is another time you've got to hold on to the front of the chair. <laughs> what he says is, the virgin birth wouldn't make any difference in Christianity. It doesn't make any difference. That it was really kind of maybe invented to make it look miraculous. That's very controversial. But what isn't controversial? What makes Christianity, what makes our faith and our faith traditions unique and important compared to every other religion? resurrection and that we're all children of God that's what makes the difference so he doesn't go so far Spahn doesn't go so far as to say we don't need the resurrection but I think he's, he's right about that but what you saw, saw happen in the Catholic translation of the ACE with uh, Isaiah 714 is like a little chink in the iceberg and we're going to have to see how that all plays out over time so, uh, was Jesus born on December 25th? No. No, probably not. No biblical reason. Okay. The earliest time we see discussion of that date is with Constantine, as I said, in 346. And Clement of Alexandria uh, raised some potential dates. This was one of them. It was a pagan holiday. Okay. Uh, and Julius, Pope Julius, wanted to cover that holiday. They said nine months from the spring, we got a problem with the shepherds, and they came up with the 25th. And it was actually then uh, cast then in stone. Okay. Um, so we, the answer is, for when was Jesus born? We don't know. Give you a window of a year or so. But as most things in our church and in the church, orthodoxy wins out in the end. Right? In other words, a group of people decided, the bishops decide, that, the popes decide, that this is what we are going to believe. Uh, Bishop Arrhenius in 196 CE, they had all of these Gnostic Gospels, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, the Gospel of Judas, they had all these other stories. All these other stories. And Christianity was very rich and very diverse. They were women priests. There were all kinds of things happening in the church. Special knowledge. My favorite is Marcion. Marcion was a Gnostic who did not believe in the Hebrew Bible. He said the God of the Hebrew Bible was inferior to the God of the New Testament. Just look at all the violence in it. We would consider that heretical. Some of you may not. <laughs> but when you look at the Hebrew Bible, if you, if you just read it from the point of view of um, inerrancy, which you should never read the Bible as inerrant without error. That would make you a fundamentalist Christian. If you want to be one, it's okay. But we don't read it inerrant. This whole idea of reading scripture inerrantly is relatively new in the last 50 years. Okay, And, and not from our tradition. It has to be interpreted with humor, tradition, and reason. Very, there's some very funny stories and the traditions and you know there's inconsistencies and the inconsistencies are okay you would have get different stories so it's, it's really okay so Bishop Arani is a 196 said we're going to get rid of all of these other books all these other works he burned them so those are the oldest copies we have okay and so what happens today is we don't view these Gnostic Gospels as canonical they are not in the canonical. But boy, are they fun to read. 
because they answer questions like Helen always has. Where was Jesus between 12 and the start of his ministry? And what's the answer? <laughs> Next week. <laughs> <laughs> I may not be here after next week, but Mark here's what I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we're, we're going to find out. And so seriously, a lot of these other gospel stories uh, were, were basically relegated to the trash pile because orthodoxy won out. Orthodoxy, just like women priests. No women priests in the Roman church, same way. They didn't want the bishops giving away property. No more women priests. Okay. So it was Pope Gregory in the seventh century, I'm going to note it here, who said we're going to cover the pagan festivals with the Christ Mass. So this is, you know, we had a lot of new, a lot of new people, a lot of guests in the church on Christmas Eve. I'll be here for all those services. So a nice thing to do, Eric, if you're here, is you can say, "Do you know to so someone new? Do you know what the Christ Mass is?" <laughs> well, now that you're an Episcopalian, you can. You can do that, right? <laughs> Wouldn't that be fun? Wouldn't that be fun? I think we'll do. We're almost through with these. We've got a couple minutes. But I want to talk for just one minute on 48 about why we celebrate Christmas. Uh, thank you. Thank you, John. Okay. What we celebrate is Jesus bringing this spark of light into the world, this new beginning, this hope for all peoples, rich, poor, young, old. Okay, and we can do that every year at Christ's birth. That's really what we celebrate. Okay, because Christ was a radical. Okay, he was unique. He was a rebel rouser. And he sure liked to eat a lot. I don't think he cooked. <laughs> but he sure liked to eat a lot. And this whole idea of him eating and being around a table is one of the reasons why we're so Eucharistic and table-centric. Because it simulates that, that whole meal and that whole thing of Jesus always being, being around the table. So we, we celebrate this new birth, this new beginning. Okay. Um, and we commit ourselves, really, at that point in time, to a new year, to a new life. Kind of reminds us of what a miracle this was, okay? And what I like to say, it creates a new consciousness, in it, which is why people love Christmas and like to do that. Because it's a way of looking back at Jesus and what he did and what he brought and how he did it. Uh, one day, if we can, we can go through the whole church year and how that happens. You know, we're in Advent now. Okay, and next week we celebrate Rose Sunday. We should uh, the, we light the rose candle, and the rose candle <coughs> is a symbol of joy. Okay, and Advent is all about anticipation, all about this blessed gift that we get in Jesus Christ that raises our consciousness each year. Uh, and that's an important thing, I think, just to kind of keep keep in mind. So to wrap this up before I go to work, um, the birth narratives are different, different, uh, but they're telling two the same story in two different ways. Uh, they're not viewed to be accurate historical events. One is to take Christ and frame him to the Gentiles. The other one is to give hope to the Israelites that all is not lost. All can be saved, and they reject him. Interesting, right? Which is a whole other story. Neither one of these authors is fudging the facts. They're telling the story in their own ways for their own readership. Does Fox tell stories in one way and CNN in another? Yes. Right? That's kind of what we see happening here. We see Luke telling the story in one way for the Gentiles. And we see the story being told differently than that. Okay? The whole idea of miraculous births, if you were in first century Palestine, would not be new. There were many. 
the Greeks always talked about, especially with the gods. Okay, so they would have gotten all of this. They would not have been surprised. They would have picked it all up and they would have got it. Okay. So what I say to you is, don't worry about these uh, conflicts. They're small. They tell the story two different ways. And uh, next week we really get into the heretical stuff. So put on your armor of God. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being there, guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So you don't have